All right. <clears throat> Got one. <laughs> All right, let's get settled. And you can move closer, unless you like me yelling. But for you, you can move closer. So you can hear better. Instead of telling me to speak up, just move closer. My goodness. <laughs> yeah, thanks. All right. Okay. Okay, everybody, tonight we're going to start on paper. And we're going to sing. Let's, uh, I'm going to just, we're going to start, we're going to sing a song on page five, but let's open in prayer first, and uh, and then we'll sing together. Lord, we thank you so much that we can come together and just learn from you and grow in you. And, and Lord, we thank you uh, for this cool room, Lord, that we have. And, and Lord, um, I pray that you would just be moving in this place, that you would speak to our hearts through your word, that we would just grow closer to you, Lord, and be strengthened in you tonight, Lord. We thank you for all that you do and all that you are. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 <clears throat> so uh, page five. There is joy in the Lord. We'll start off with that one. There is joy in the Lord. There is love in his spirit. There is hope in the knowledge of him. There's a fountain that flows like a river from heaven, abounding in love to my soul. All blessing and honor are his. All glory and power are his. Let all wisdom and strength be the Lord's in this place. Let all glory be given to him. <clears throat> there is joy in the Lord. There is love in his spirit. There is hope in the knowledge of him there's a fountain i know every time i am near it my heart overflows to my soul all blessing and honor are his all glory and power are his let all wisdom and strength be the lord's in this place let all glory be given to him. There is joy in the Lord. There is love in his spirit. There is hope in the knowledge of him. There's a fountain that flows like a river from heaven, abounding in love to my soul. See you. Pick another song here. <clears throat> Let's do Open the Eyes of My Heart on page three. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. 
Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, 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 I want to see you. Holy, 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 I want to see you. Lord God, we thank you so much. That's the desire of our heart. We just want to see you. We want to grow closer to you, Lord God. Just open our hearts to you. Through your word tonight, Lord, may your spirit speak to us. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Kevin, you want to just close that back door? All right. John chapter 1. And last week we got as far as verse 18. <coughs> and we looked last week. We learned about who the Word is. We learned about the Word. The Word was with God. The Word is God. The Word was with God in the beginning. The Word created all things and through Him all things were made. The Word is life and the light of men. But his creation did not comprehend or grab hold of him. And the Lord sent a man named John to bear witness of the light that all would believe. For to everyone who received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. Isn't that wonderful? For everyone who believes on his name, we begin the right to become the children of God. And then he closed it up by saying, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then he introduces us to this one that he's been speaking of in verse 17. Verse 17, it says here, where are we saying? For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So in verse 17, we're introduced who this word is, and the word is Jesus Christ. And he has come to declare to us grace and truth and to declare to us who the Father is. And so in, as we head into chapter or in the rest of the chapter here, we're going to be introduced to another character that we've already been introduced to, John, John the Baptist. And we know John the Baptist because he uh, shares the same middle name as another famous actor, can you guys remember who it is? It's Kermit the Frog. Kermit the Frog. John the Baptist. Wow, that one felt flat. That's Kermit the Frog, John the Baptist, you know, that's... It's, it's, they both eat bugs? Thank you, Levi. That's good. They both eat bugs. What chap? Chapter 1. Of John, for the people in the back who can't hear me. <laughs> There's some chairs up here in the hearing zone. <laughs> I'm just going to turn the thing around and go sit over there. <clears throat> All right. So, we're introduced to a fellow John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist, here in this section, we're going to see he's made a big splash, as it were. Um, and thousands of people are flocking to hear him preach as he's preparing the people. He is preaching a, a message of repentance. Turn, 
Repent. Prepare yourself. Cleanse yourself in the waters of baptism and prepare yourself for the Messiah is coming. And he is preaching this, and this has gotten the attention of those in Jerusalem, the lead, the religious leaders. And so they're sending out people to watch John the Baptist and to ask him questions. Now, we're told a little bit about this rough man in Matthew chapter 3, verse 4. You don't have to turn there. It's just one verse we're going to read. It says, Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. John the Baptist was an interesting character. He's wearing camel's hair, which wouldn't be exactly the most comfortable thing to wear. And he wrapped a leather belt around his waist, and he enjoyed locusts and wild honey. Now, I know that Randy would be all pro-wild honey, but I'm not sure about the locust part. It's like, what do you dip your... What do you dip in the honey? The locusts. Huh? Honey mustard. Honey mustard. Yep. Yeah. It tastes a little bit like chicken. It tastes like chicken. I had locusts. Yeah? Oh. It's like honey glazed. Honey glazed chicken. Well, okay. Yeah, because I guess locusts, they're bigger, so they, you know, their drumsticks are bigger. So. <laughs> He was an odd fellow. He was called by God before his birth. He was a Nazarite from birth. That meant that he didn't cut his hair. It meant he had long hair. And he abstained from alcohol and being around dead people. And, and, um, and so he led a real secluded life, you could say. And in Luke chapter 7, verse 28, Jesus testifying of who John the Baptist was, he says, For I say to you, among those born of women, there is, no, no, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. John the Baptist was the last of the Old Testament prophets. He was the greatest. And you might say, well, wait a second. Isaiah and Jeremiah. Well, what do you mean he's the greatest? John the Baptist had a very short ministry. But he was the greatest. Why? Because he saw what they all longed to see, the Messiah standing in front of him. The culmination of all the promises coming together and standing before him. And John went, wow, he is here. The answer is here. He's standing before us. And he cried out to the, to the people, hey, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He saw the answer, the longing of the nation for so long standing before him but it says here but we uh, but we who are the least are greater because we have received what we've received something that john didn't receive and that is the gift of salvation on our lives and the holy spirit coming and dwelling in us and jesus coming and dwelling in us something that they longed for all that time he died before that took place when he died upon the cross john the baptist lost his head not not by his own thing he lost his head because Herod took it from him. But he, he, we have something much better. So you can see John the Baptist is like, I'm the greatest of the prophets because I saw this, but I didn't make it. You know, he's up in heaven going, Jesus, if you just left, you could have left me in the prison a little longer. You know, come on. He's like, okay, okay. But he's there. But he's there. So John here is stirring things up. As he's preaching the word, he's preparing people. People's hearts are longing. And so they're coming out and they're being baptized. And his baptism was a baptism of forgiveness of sins, washing your sins away. That's what they were symbolizing in the baptism. And so he was baptizing, preparing them for the way of the Lord, that the Lord is coming. And he's teaching them. And, and of course, the Jews, the uh, Jewish religious leaders, heard about this. And you can imagine they weren't too happy because... They, they, they went out into the temple courtyard to do their teaching for the week, and they found a bunch of empty seats. And they said, wait a second, where is everybody? They said, oh, they're down by the river. Listen to that crazy guy who eats locusts. And they're like, excuse me? And so they're going to send down some guys to go ask him some questions, to confront him and ask him some questions. And so here it says, now this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? They were sent down to ask, who are you? Who are you? More likely, the question could be said like this, who do you think you are? 
because we know that the religious leaders, the Pharisees, it's going to tell us later, is the Pharisees who sent them were not happy because anyone who's in, in approaching or encro encroaching upon their territory just upset them because it took their power away. And so here they, they come before and they say, who are you? Who do you, who do you think you are? And they're asking him that question. Sorry, notes mixed up here. I got it. it. Says, "Who are you?" And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, "I am not the Christ." He stood up, stood up right away, and said, "I am not the Christ. I'm not the Messiah." And he and um, and he asked, uh, or sorry, and they asked him, "What then? Are you Elijah?" And he said, "I am not." Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you that we may give answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. His answer to these guys, the, the priests and Levites, is to quote to them scripture. Why? Because the priests and Levites, their job was to do what? To learn the word of God and to teach the people. And so he's like, well, I'll give you scripture then. I am the one, he says. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. Prepare the way of the Lord. And in Isaiah's prophecy, in Isaiah where this comes from, Isaiah chapter uh, 40. Isaiah is speaking to the people, declaring to them, prepare yourself for the Messiah's coming. Prepare yourselves for he will overcome. And so John here is saying to the people, prepare yourself. And so the people would understand this because whenever a, a military person or one of the emperors or even one of the governors would come into the areas, they would have to prepare. And we know that here in our own town. When somebody special comes to town, that's when you see them clean it up. You see they put new planters up and you know, they, they, they spruce things up. I, I think I've told this story before when the Olympics was, the Winter Olympics was on and they brought the torch through Kimberly and they cleaned, the, the, the Kimberly was frozen solid. People were falling right and left. It was a disaster. It was the iciest winter we had. The, the Platzel was terrible. And all of a sudden, all these government employees show up and they start chiseling away and putting extra sand down and even blasting some of this ice away and they cleaned it perfectly. They even scraped away the gravel, made it all nice and shiny. Then 2,000 people filled the platzel and 10 minutes later, they were all gone. And I went, wow, that was worth it. I stood outside the store and I saw the guy run by and I saw the people disappear. And I was like, woo! -hoo. Well, they spent two weeks cleaning the streets for that 10 minutes, but they were preparing the way. And that's what, that's what John the Baptist's job was, to prepare the way to get people's hearts clean, to get them prepared for Jesus, for the message that Jesus was bringing. And so he's preparing the way, and he says to these guys, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the, uh, the prophet Isaiah said. Now those who were sent were from the Pharisees, and they asked him, saying, why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? Who is the prophet? Who's that prophet? The prophet? They, they, they based it off of a, a prophecy uh, that Moses said that a prophet greater than him would come. And the prophet is basically speaking of the Messiah would come. But they expected another prophet, a man to come. And so they were looking for another man. So a that's why they... man in the flesh? Yes, yeah. And so they were looking for it. So it's interesting because they say, you know, they're expecting Elijah to come back because they know he's supposed to come back. And they know there's supposed to be another prophet that's greater. And the prophet, I believe, you know, is speaking here is it could be John the Baptist because he was the last of the great prophets. So it's like, yeah, okay. But they're saying, since you're not these guys, who are you? And why? who gives you the authority? Notice it's the same language they're going to use on Jesus. Who gives you the authority to do these things? Why are you baptizing in water? He says, why are you baptizing water if you're not the Christ or Elijah or the prophet? John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal straps I am not worthy to loose. These things were done in uh, Beth, uh, Beth Arba, beyond the Jordan, 
where John was baptizing. So they're, they're questioning him, and he says, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. I wonder, when he's saying this, is Jesus literally standing right there? Because he was there. He might have been standing right there in the crowd. And he says, there is one standing among you whom you do not know. And remember what we read last week. It says that he came to his own, but they didn't know him. Because they weren't looking for the Lord. They were looking to the temple. They were looking to different things, government, whatever it was, for their salvation. And they weren't looking for him. And yet he was standing right there. And he says that he was the one coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal straps I'm not worthy to loose. The next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is one of those amazing, amazing statements. He says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. To the Jewish people, this had a lot of deep significance. To us, we think, okay, the Lamb of God, that's Jesus, so can we know what we're talking about? But to the Jewish people, a lamb was something they had to bring yearly, or more than one time a year, depending on how many feasts they went to, to bring their sacrifices before the Lord. And that lamb, that innocent lamb, would lose its life and shed its blood to cover your sins. And this would be something they did year after year after year throughout their whole life. It was something that the nation of Israel understood very deeply. The lamb was that picture of that innocent life that was an innocent life and that innocent blood that was shed to cover their sins so that they could be forgiven for another year. And so when John looks over and he sees Jesus and says, uh, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I'll tell you, those guys that were with him, their heads turned. They wanted to know, who are you talking about? The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This was the Lamb, the ultimate Lamb, the last sacrifice that would take away the sins of the world. Why? Because the Lamb that they sacrificed only took covered, covered their sin temp temporarily. They always had to go back. And that was something that was heavy on their hearts because they always had to go back. So were they expecting a lamb then, Steve? Hmm? Were they expecting a lamb or were they expecting, they were expecting the Messiah? But the language they're using, the Messiah would take away their sins. Right. Right? The lamb covers their sins. Right. Right? His blood. So the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And they go, whoa. This is the ultimate sacrifice. This is the final sacrifice. Now, remember, in the Old Testament... Uh, believers and the believers this time, they didn't know how the Messiah would take away their sins. They just knew that he would. They didn't know. Now there is prophecy in the Old Testament that speaks of his sacrifice, but they hadn't put it together. It was still a mystery to them. And so they're looking and they just say, oh, the Lamb of God who takes away this. This is what we've been waiting for. This is what we've been waiting for. We've been waiting for this sacrifice. And of course, pointing to a lamb, he's, he's pointing to Jesus. As Jesus walks towards him. You know, Steve, we have a temple once a year, the priest would forgive the sins. Yeah. So, say from January to December, say December, they would have been with him. You think about it, he committed a sin in January. He felt so bad, it's horrible, but he had to wait 11 months before the priest would have been forgiven. Yeah. That was just your head and all that. Well, and they, well, they, they also had, because uh, that was the, the yearly sacrifice was for the whole nation. So yeah, that covered the nation's sin. But you would make your sacrifice once a year for your sins. So yeah, so you would, you'd be like, okay, the nation's covered, but now I've screwed up, so now I've got to wait until next oh, March year. or whatever, yeah, to make my sacrifice. Oh, you know. Yeah, yeah, that would be hard. And so you, it, and it was, the thing about it that was so, uh, it says in Hebrews too, they had to continually go, continually go. So it was on your mind. You went and brought the sacrifice, but you knew it only covered you for that year. So then you had to come back. So to think about the Lamb of God who would come and take away the sins of the world once and for all, wow. So it says, this is he, he 
of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he has be, for he sorry for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptized with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So, said that we've got to wait a year or wait however many months before we're going to sacrifice to him. Now, right now, when we are free. Yeah. Because whenever we do sin, we just confess it to God and repent from it. Yeah. So we are free all the time. Oh, you still have to wait a year before you that. I'm, well, just, I'm kidding. I'm yes, kidding. Yeah, oh, yes, I know. I'm a no. special person. I deserve to wait a year. No, I'm just kidding. So that, that's a big thing. That's a huge thing. Because yeah. You could just... Ask God, give it to God, yeah. and let him deal with it. Yeah. That's, yeah, and that's the beautiful that's the beautiful thing about Jesus' sacrifice is that we're free once and for all. His death upon the cross cross covered our sins, past, present, and future. And notice what it says for the sins of the whole world. It wasn't just for one person or one group, it was for the whole world. Everyone's sins can be forgiven. And so looking to this. And remembering this would also bring the image to their minds of Abraham and Isaac. Abraham brought his son Isaac up to Mount Moriah to sacrifice him because the Lord told him to. And in his obedience, he set up the altar. He set up the wood. He placed his son upon the wood. He lifted up the dagger and the Lord stopped him. And it said, the Lord will provide for himself. Sorry, the Lord will provide the proper languages. The Lord will provide himself a lamb. And here... Years and years later, we have Jesus standing there, the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world, who in three years from now will hang upon the cross on Mount Moriah and die. The same mountain where Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac, Jesus would lay down his life for us, the ultimate sacrifice. It's beautiful. Jesus is our pure Sacrifice, sacrificial lamb without spot or blemish. He is what we call the second Adam because he was born without sin. And he was tempted in all points, as it says in Hebrews chapter 4, 15. Uh, 15. It says tempted, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. He was tried and tested and he died for us pure that we might live again. So John here, he's he's declaring to them that he saw him at the baptism. It says, And John bore witness, I uh, I, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. It's amazing here. What he's saying here is he didn't know who Jesus was. Now, Jesus was a relative. But he didn't know that Jesus was the Messiah until he saw the Holy Spirit come down him at the baptism. He knew that Jesus was a great teacher. He knew that he was a holy man, but he did not know that he was the Messiah until he saw the Holy Spirit come down upon him and rest upon him. So when we're reading this section, this is probably 40, 50 days after his baptism, because Jesus, after his baptism, went into the wilderness for 40 days and then came back out and began to call his disciples unto him and start his earthly ministry. So in this story that we're reading this right now, this instant here, he's speaking and Jesus is there. He says, behold, the Lamb of God. This is after his baptism. And he declares to his disciples and John bore witness, saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it remained upon him and I did not know him, but Uh, But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining on him, 
This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit, and I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. He makes this declaration to his disciples and to those around him. I didn't know him until the Holy Spirit came upon him. This is the one who will baptize in the Holy Spirit. But how did he know that, though? Was he, was he told by a messenger? Was he, told he was told by the Lord. He was, okay, so yes. he had a vision? Yeah, the Lord would have spoken to him somehow. It doesn't say how, but the Lord spoke to him, yeah. Yeah. The Lord gave him a word. And so that's the thing. The Lord can give us, and we've talked about that as we've been talking about the Holy Spirit, gifts of the Holy Spirit. The Lord can give us a word. And we hold on to it. And like it says in, uh, in uh, I think it's Matthew's Gospel, Mary was given all these, these things from the angels and from the Lord, and it says she pondered them. She held on to them in her heart. And so he, gave, he was given this word that you will know him when you see the Holy Spirit come down upon him. Now you got to think, in his mind he would say, I don't know what that's going to look like. I don't know. Jesus comes forth and he baptizes him with water and the Holy Spirit comes down upon him and he goes, there it is. It's happening right in front of me. And that's awesome how the Lord works that way. He'll give us something and we hold on to it and we go, I don't know what that means. I don't know. And then we see it and we go, oh, wow. The Lord revealed that to me and then now I see it happening right in front of me. And the Lord gave it to him and explained it to him and it says here, that it happened right from him, and he says, and he testified that this is the Son of God. He knew. This is the Messiah. And then in verse 35, it says, Again, the next day John stood with two of his disciples, and looking at Jesus he, as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. you got to wonder if this now has become his way of pointing Jesus pointing out Jesus to everybody. That from now on this point, from then on, he just said, behold the Lamb of God. There's the Lamb of God. Lamb of God's over there eating lunch. Go see him. He's just like, the Lamb of God is right there, you guys. Listen up. He's here. Remember, John's ministry was to prepare the way for Jesus. Jesus is now here. And so he's pointing, he's telling everybody, go, go to him. Go listen to him. Right? Go listen to him. He said he, he said he must increase and I must decrease. He knew that his ministry was winding up now that Jesus is now beginning his ministry. And so here he says before the guys, he says straight out, straight out to them, behold the Lamb of God. To his disciples, it says two of his disciples heard him speaking and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following said to them, what do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, when translated teacher, where are you staying? Where are you, where are you sleeping? Where are you guys hanging out? And I love what Jesus says. None of your beeswax. No, he says, come and see. Come and see. Come and spend some time with us. And they came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the 10th hour. So these two disciples just leave John and begin to follow Jesus. They begin to follow after Jesus. And Jesus turns around and says, hey, what are you guys looking for? And they say, where are you staying? And he says, well, come on. Come on and see. And they get to spend the day with Jesus. And in Psalm chapter 34, verse 8, it says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Come taste, come experience, come and see. We can tell people about the Lord. We can show them scripture and share with them. But sometimes we need to say, come and see. Come and see where we stay. Come to church. Experience the love of God. How many of you guys can say in your life that when you came into church, you felt there was something different? There was just something. It's a common thing. People come in and especially if they're not church, they come in and go, wow, there's something different here. Now, some people go, there's something different here. It makes me feel weird because these people are all nice to each other. And I don't, don't usually expect people to be nice to each other in a room. Like they're actually talking with each other. And uh, I don't know about that. But there's something about the grace of God and the love of God flowing in a fellowship that just 
opens up someone's heart. And so sometimes we need to share with people. We need to show them the scriptures, but we also need to say, come and see. Come and experience it. Come and taste and see. Jesus didn't say, come to a seminar and I will teach you in three easy installments of 1995. No, he said, come and hang out. Come and eat with us. Come and hang out. Spend the day with us. And they did. He said to them, come and see. And they came and they saw where he was staying and remained there with him that day. One of the two who heard John speaking followed him and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So here we find Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, who is a disciple of John the Baptist and now is following Jesus. I think it's interesting because it doesn't tell us who the other disciple was. And that leads us to speculate that it was probably John. Why? Because John tends to do in his, in his, uh, his gospel here, he tends not to mention himself. He just says, the disciple whom Jesus loved or the disciple was there with him or he doesn't use refer to himself. And so the fact that it doesn't refer to who the other disciple was, that many believe that he was speaking of John, that John was following after John the Baptist. And then now he's following after Jesus. It's just an interesting thing to think about. And so we find Andrew and Andrew, the first thing that Andrew does is he goes and finds his brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated as stone. Andrew brings his brother to Jesus. He goes and gets his brother and says, Hey, we found the Messiah. You gotta come. You gotta come. And Simon follows his brother. And Jesus looks at him and says, Oh, you're Simon, son of Jonah. And you can see Simon going, Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's who I am. And he says, You should be called Cephas, which is translated as stone. I guess that's a good thing. You're going to be called stone, rockhead. You got to go, Jesus, are you calling him that because he's pretty thick or because that he's immovable? What, this nickname, solid. is he solid? And you can see his brother going, well, I can think of a few things we can <laughs> razz him about. But I love this because Andrew brings his brother to Jesus. And how important it is to bring people to Jesus. To give them a ride, pick them up. Say, come on, you're coming with me. We're going to go spend some time with Jesus. There's even going to be food. And sometimes, only sometimes are there donuts. I, there's no donuts this week. Man. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Sorry, that just hit me right now. I was just like, oh yeah, you said you were bringing donuts this week. Sometimes there's donuts. So don't, don't, op, don't promise that because then it falls short when there isn't. Don't count on it. But Simon meets Jesus and instantly his life and his name are changed. The thing about Simon that's so beautiful is because he makes me feel really good. Because his life was changed when he met Jesus. His name was changed when he met Jesus. But he still has plenty of work to go. And it makes me go, oh, thank you. Because uh, there's plenty of work to go in me. But plenty of rough edges. It says here, the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. It's wonderful how people come to Jesus. The people come to Jesus in all kinds of ways. There's no cookie cutter salvation. Have you ever, ever had someone say, how are you saved? Were you on your knees? Were you standing up? How was it? And you kind of think, what, what kind of question is that? Did you say the right words? Did you do this? Did you do what? And you might say, well, you know, oh, some people will say, well, I, I got saved at a Billy Graham crusade. So I just said whatever they were saying. But, you know, I meant it. And the Lord came in my life and changed me that day. Oh, OK, good. 
Or I was saved at a church service. You know, I just felt the Lord come upon me and a pastor led me in prayer. Great. A friend shared with me and they led me in prayer. Oh, awesome. That's amazing. But some people, they literally are all alone. My dad's testimony was that one night the Lord just came and he cried out to the Lord and he said at that moment he knew he was saved. That he was all alone by himself. The Lord came to him. And here we see G Philip here. No one brought him. He didn't go to some class or seminar. Jesus literally walked up and said, come on. And for some of us, that's it. It's, Jesus just said, you're going to follow me. And you went, yeah, huh? Okay. No turning back. I'm going to follow. Jesus works in so many ways in our lives to bring us to Jesus. For some people, it's very quick. How many people had a very quick salvation where you heard the message and it was like, oh, yes, I'll take it. Yeah. How many of you were, it's, it was kind of a slow, it took some time to sink in? Yeah. For each of us, how many, how many was it medium? <laughs> For each of us, it's different how the Lord works in our hearts. I can say that I gave my heart to the Lord as a young child. I remember coming back from a church service and knowing something had changed. I just have that vivid memory that sitting in the back of the station wagon thinking there's something that's changed in my heart. This is amazing, and I was so excited. But when I was a teenager, I remember rededicating my life, saying, okay, from now on, this is it. No turning back. No more excuses. I can't just glide along on my parents' stuff. I have to make a commitment. And I can say that was the point that I recommitted, just said, okay, this is it. We're going. And, you know, for each of us, we have different stories of how the Lord worked in our lives and different testimonies. And the Lord works in us in different ways. So don't ever feel like, well, oh, I wasn't at a Billy Graham crusade or I didn't. I, here's the one thing that drives me crazy. When people say, you have to know the date and hour. If you don't know the date and hour, then you're not saved. Well, I don't know because I was probably six, five, four. I don't know, five probably. I don't know. Oh, great. I guess I'm not saved. No. The Lord works in us. The Lord works in us. And so don't, don't let someone try to steal your joy is what I'm trying to say here. When they try to cookie cutter it or try to place it in here. As we're seeing in this section, each person came a different way. Each person came a different way. Uh, John and Andrew came most likely, or most likely John, but they came. Why? Because John the Baptist said, hey, go follow him. And they followed Jesus. Uh, Simon came because his brother came and got him. Philip's now come because Jesus literally just said, follow me. And he said, yes, sir. And followed after Jesus. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom, the, whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And he said to him, come and see. And they came and saw where he was. Oh, sorry. That, well, that was weird. Yeah, no, sorry. Wrong page. And Nathaniel said to him, it's just, it was the exact same. Come and see. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. So here we see uh, Nathaniel now. Philip goes to Nathaniel. And Nathaniel is sitting there and he says, hey, we found him. Oh, yeah, yeah, we found him. Jesus of Nazareth. And his first response is, can anything good come from Nazareth? Seriously? Now, Nazareth wasn't necessarily a bad town. It was just a nowhere town. It was a, can anything good come out of Cranmer? Can it, you know, it was a place that no one's ever heard of. It was, who, who would even be there? Why, you know, it's kind of like when you go into acting and they ask you to change your name. Because no one who isn't famous would have that name. Have you seen some of the celebrities' names? Where did they come up with that one? You think they, they got some Scrabble things and threw them out and just put the letters together? There, that's my famous name. It's like, then you find out their real name. You go, you should have stuck with your real name. I don't know. But here he says, he's skeptical because he's saying, no, come on. The Messiah is going to come from Jerusalem. The Messiah is going to come from somewhere famous. The Messiah is not going to come from Nazareth. You know, Nowheresville. Like, come on. And so he's a little skeptical. And But here's the thing is, Philip doesn't argue. He doesn't try to convince Nathaniel. 
He doesn't try to convince him that good things come from Nazareth. Oh, yeah, let me think. Come on, there's that baseball player. No, wait, he, you know, and then there was this guy. No, uh, you know, he doesn't try to convince him. He just says what? Come and see. Come and see. Sometimes we spend too much time doing what? Arguing with people. Trying to argue them into the kingdom. And, and there's a saying that says if you can argue them in, they can be argued out. So we just say, come and see. I don't know if Adam and Eve had belly buttons. Just come and see. You know, the, all those silly questions we get, right? I, I don't know how Noah fit all the animals on the ark. You know, I, I, I've seen charts, but, you know, come and see. We just say, come, see. Come see what the Lord is doing. Come see who he is and how he's working. Come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered and said to him, Because I say to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, Hereafter you shall see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So Nathanael is coming back with Philip and Jesus looks up and states to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. Jesus is saying that Nathanael was real, that he was genuine, that he wasn't fake, that there wasn't any underlying agenda. He wasn't wearing a mask. He was real. Now, in the church, there's this thing that has crept in where we get into this habit of doing what? Wearing a mask. We have our church mask, and we keep it in the glove department, and we pull it out on Sundays. And as we finish fighting with our wife, we put on our church mask, and we get out of the car. And we can smile, and everything's happy and good. <laughs> what? No, I was, that's why we come separately. No, I'm just kidding. Can't fight, if can't fight if you're not together. That's why I, I, use, I haven't said it in a long time, but I used to say, if I see you showing up in two vehicles, we need to talk. So it's like, pull you aside. I think the joke used to be, I think I've got a book for you, give you a marriage book or something. But, but we have this bad tendency of wearing a mask and, 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 and being phony when we're at church and that's not good it's not good why because when we come here we're supposed to be coming here to do what to grow to be built up and so that means we need to be honest and open and transparent with one another we need to say yeah i'm having a hard time i'm struggling or i need to work on this but we also have to, have to be willing and open to work on it for example if we have a real potty mouth out there and we turn on the church filter when we come to church we might say, well, you know what? I want to be genuine. I want to be real. So I'm just going to turn off the filter. What do you think we're going to start doing? Hey, brother, we need to chat. That language is not appropriate anywhere. <laughs> that, you need to work on that. Let's, let's help you with that. But sometimes we put on a mask all the time and so that we can never grow because we're always being fake. Someone will say, hey, have you ever struggled with that? Nope, never struggled with that. You ever had the issue? Nope. No, no, I'm good. No. And you think, this person's too good to be true. I think they're wearing a mask. Because then everybody and then everybody starts putting on masks and, and being fake with one another. And that's why it's important for us to be real. And so right away Jesus looks at him and he says, Indeed, here is an Israelite in whom is no deceit. Here's a man that has no deceit in his heart, who is standing purely before me. And Nathaniel said to him, How do you know? Know me. And Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. You can imagine, he's like, How did you know I was sitting under the fig tree? Wow. 
And this is where um, a lot of pastors have this idea, and it's possible. Again, we're speculating because it doesn't tell us what Philip was, or what Nathaniel was doing under the fig tree. Because oftentimes, Jewish men who were wanting to know more about the Lord, and Philip seems to be one who is interested in knowing and growing in the Lord, would go and sit and listen to a rabbi teach. And so they believe that uh, Nathaniel was listening to a rabbi teach about Jacob. And Jacob is the heel catcher. Jacob is the conniver, the deceitful one. That's what Jacob's names mean, heel catcher, which means deceiver. And so he was pondering about Jacob, thinking about Jacob, this one that the Lord used, even though he had this issue of being a deceiver, being a tricker. And we know that in Jacob's story, it didn't always work out because he tricked his, he tried to trick, and then he got tricked back. And he went back and forth until finally he went, maybe I should stop doing this. It's not working out for me. And he says to him, Jesus says to him right away, you are a Israelite who, whom I find no deceit. And you can see him going, well, I was just pondering that myself about Jacob. And then he goes on here and he says, I saw you under the fig tree. And he's like, whoa, that's where I was sitting. That's where I was thinking. And Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, most surely I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Here another reference to the story of Jacob, Jacob's ladder. And giving him that insight that Jesus is the ladder that the angels ascend and descend upon. And that he is going to see greater things than this. I think I would have been hooked right there. I'd be like, well, wow. What am I going to see that's greater than this? You just told me where I was sitting. You just revealed me what I was pondering when I was sitting under the tree. Yes, give me more, give me more. Nathaniel is hooked. He started with a skeptical heart. Can anything good come from Nazareth? And now we see him declaring with boldness that Jesus is the Messiah. And Jesus says to him, hey, you ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. The Lord moved in his heart. John testified here in this section that we've gone through. John testified that Jesus was the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. And he would be the one who would come and baptize in the Holy Spirit. Andrew went to his brother and declared to him, we have found the Messiah. Philip found the Lord in a private moment when the Lord spoke to him and said, follow me. Philip testified to Nathanael, we have found him whom Moses in the law, in the law also and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Philip found Jesus and declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. Sorry, Nathaniel found Jesus and said, Rabbi, you're the son of God, the king of Israel. Each one of these men had a testimony of who Jesus is in their life. So here's a question for tonight as we finish up. Who is Jesus to you personally? Who is Jesus to you personally? Now, I'm not talking about the facts of who Jesus is. We know that and studying the word of God and getting to know who Jesus is. But who is he personally? What has he done for you? Because that is part of our testimony. How has Jesus moved in your life? That is something we need to think about because that's something we can come to someone and say, I need to tell you how Jesus has worked in my life. Come and see. Come and see what he's done. Because this is what he has done in my life. When I think about it, I say Jesus has been my constant friend and protector. He has been the one who has walked with me through my life. And I look back and I know when I see I could be a completely different man if it wasn't for Jesus. I look back at my life and say, why did I make that choice? Why did I make that choice? Why did I go there? Why did I do this? Why? Because Jesus was with me. I could have easily made the other choice. 
and ended up being a totally different person. I could have been a miserable cuss. I could have been all kinds of things, but the Lord walked with me through my life and protected and watched over me. You know, many people will say, well, you got saved as a kid. You know, you don't really have a testimony. I have a testimony that the Lord walked with me all these years. And through all the struggles and through all the dark times and good times and everything, he was there with me. And I can testify of that. That's amazing. And, and, and I'm so thankful for that. I don't have to say like they always say, oh, man, shucks. Uh, I wish I was a, you know, a drug addict or I wish I murdered some people because then I would have a testimony. You know, we, we've all heard those testimonies. We go, wow, that's really powerful. Oh, man, I wish I killed someone. It's like, no. You need help. <laughs> I need help. <laughs> what was it? Is that Tim Hawkins who says, oh, man, I wish I was hooked on drugs. I was, I was addicted to crack. I wish I was addicted Thanks to crack. God. Thanks a lot. <laughs> it's like, no. We have to stop and say, Lord, and think about it. What has the Lord done for you? And in each and every one of our lives, he's, he's impacted us in a different way. And we all have different backgrounds, whatever it might be. There's addiction, there's marriage issues, there's all kinds of things that we have in our past. Struggles, dark times, losses in our family. All of us have all of these things that the Lord has brought us through or is bringing us through that we can testify, hey, this is the Lord. Come and see, look what he's done in my life. That's why I always encourage people, because when people look at us, they just see us. They don't know what we've come through. So they might say, well, that guy's got it all together. And we can go, oh, no, I don't. I don't. If it wasn't for the Lord, no. Let me tell you where I've come from. Let me tell you what I've gone through. Let me tell you where the Lord has brought me. And come and see what he can do for you. That's the exciting thing. Who is he to you today and what is he doing in your life? And how can we say to those around us, come and see? This is what he's done. And, and so when we think, when we talk about witnessing, when we talk about sharing with others, often we think about sharing scripture and stuff, which is all important and good. But part of it is simply to say, this is what the Lord did for me. This is what he did for me. And being raw and personal and just saying, this is where he brought me. And he can do the same for you. Come and see. Come and see. All right. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for your truth. We thank you so much for your word, Lord God. May we always continue to draw closer to you. May we be built up, built up in you and strengthened in you, Lord God. This week, may we ponder what you have done in our lives and, and really just... Bring it to the surface and say, oh, Lord, we're so thankful for all that you've done, for all that you are doing and all that you will do, Lord God. And that we can share it with others. Give us those opportunities to say, come and see. Come, come and see our Lord, our Savior, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He has washed us clean and made us new. Oh, Lord, we thank you so much for your precious gift. We thank you for your hand moving in our lives today, Lord God. May we be built up in you and strengthened. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.